Ephesians chapter number 3. Now, what we're going to do tonight, probably won't take but maybe, well, I can't tell you a time because it'll end up going longer. Um, that we're, we've been away from, this is studying uh, Israel and her program and looking at that. We have been away since June of 2015 from this study. So about two and a half years. I didn't realize it had gone that long. We were just going to take the summer off <laughs> and come back and start, and then it just kind of got away from us. So what I want to do this evening is just kind of go back and, and say, okay, here's why we need to understand Israel, and then what we've kind of looked at in the past, and then where we're going to go starting next week. Because I, I'm, we're recording it. It will be on YouTube. It will be on the website. The audio will so everything will be normal, like it normally is, but um, it's just a matter of just kind of getting our feet back under um, the, the thing. The first thing that we need to remember, Ephesians 3, uh, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may, un may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel." The, the thing that we need to understand, again, and, and as I look around the room, I, I understand we know this, we are not spiritual Israel, and we are the body of Christ. But yet there is extreme value in order to understand our program, you have to have some understanding of Israel's program. Uh, if you look back at chapter 2 of Ephesians, there... The, we're not going to catch, again, every little detail. We didn't do it before. Uh, in, in the past, this is lesson 42 in this study. In the past, we looked at um, the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the New Covenant, the Mosaic covenant. We looked at the issue of, uh, of the Sabbath and what that is all about. We looked at Israel's... Uh, Redemption calendar, that's Leviticus 23. We've looked, we looked at Leviticus 26, then those courses of judgment. There are five of them. We went in then and looked into Deuteronomy 30, 31, 32, and the national anthem of Israel. Then we went over and we looked at some things about prophecy. And then we looked at the issue of the day of the Lord and, and the route uh, and, and, and the, the route of uh of his second coming and some things about the United States not being there. We looked about the issue of uh, 2 Thessalonians with the Antichrist. So we've kind of covered a broadcast of things. There's value in understanding that. If, if you look at Ephesians 2, look at verse 11 and 12. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now, when Paul writes that verse, he is making an assumption that you understand what it is to be called uncircumcision and, and who is called circumcision. He doesn't go into great detail here about what those two terms are referring to, but he assumes that when you, when you read that, you're going to go and go, yep, I, I remember that. That goes back to Genesis 17. That goes back to Abraham, when Abraham got the covenant and was ratified, and then the sign and the seal was given to the Abrahamic covenant of the issue of circumcision. And if I was on the wrong side of that sign then I was cut off, Genesis 17 tells us. By the way, that Israel isn't Israel until after the Exodus events happened. Abraham is not a Jew. Abraham's a Gentile. 
God made a, an agreement with him. He put that sign in there to then divide and make a separation amongst humanity. This side of the wall, the wall is circumcision. This side is my people. This side is not my people. They're cut off, okay? Look at verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, so you're cut off. Being aliens from the commonwealth of who? Of Israel. Now Paul's going to make an, an assumption here that you understand the thing about after the Exodus, when Israel, his firstborn, they go across the Red Sea, they're delivered by the blood on the doorpost and by power with the, the Red Sea. When that happened, and his nation, Israel, that they're a commonwealth, that's the government style, that they were, they had, and, and that if you're on the wrong side of the wall, so now you're not a Jew, you are a Gentile, then you have this issue of your strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So when Paul writes this, and, and this is a passage that we use for time past, and we, we get into the studies of right division with, but the, the issue that I'm trying to show to you is Paul assumes you understand all that. Uh, if you come over to Romans chapter number 9, Romans chapter number 9. There, so it, there is value in understanding Israel's program. And the value then comes, and again, you, you will never understand every little detail. We'll, we're going to be looking at some things uh, kind of in a, in a high point overview idea. There's some things in the law and Numbers and Leviticus, where, Paul, where Moses gives that law, that I read and I look at and I go, how in the world do you do that? I can't do that. It wasn't written to me, number one, but how in the world do you do that? You, you know that they cannot have a mixed blend in their garments. Okay, They ha can't have cotton and wool mixed together. They ha it has to be all the same linen. You can't do that today. I'm wearing a 100% cotton shirt right here, but my pants are 50-50-50, if you believe that. I mean, I'm looking at some T-shirts, and they're tri-color, tri-part T-shirts, cotton, polyester, and rayon or ragon or whatever it's called. Well, rayon, yeah, whatever. How in the world does that work? How can you take a 100% shirt and make it out of 50-50-50, you know? You can't. <laughs> Okay, so then I read and it's made in China. And I'm like, okay, so maybe it's 50, 20, 30 something. You know, who knows? But the thing is, is when you go back, there's a reason why God did that. And it was so that Israel would look so different than anybody else. Then when they look different, they would say, wait a minute, who are, why do you look so different from us? Then they could tell them we're peculiar. We're God's people. If you look at Romans 9, and in the book of Romans, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is dealing with uh, dispensationally what's going to happen now with Israel. Romans 9 is Israel's past, the history of Israel's past. Romans 10 is their present condition. And then Romans 11 is their future situation. But look at Romans 9. If you look there at verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. How much, you're, Paul assumes that you have some working understanding of all of those little components there. And so when you think about understanding Israel... By the way, if you understand Israel's adoption, then you can quickly understand our adoption and how that works. You, you look at the issues there about the covenants. Now, we don't participate in the covenants, but when you get over to that new covenant, Paul says we're the ministers of the new. But we're, how do we minister the new? In spirit, not in the word, not in the word, but in the spirit of it. Because the, the basis of the new covenant is Calvary, and that's our basis as well. So when you get into some of this, come over to chapter 15 of Romans. 
it's really kind of an interesting thing because I hear people say all the time, well, why do you need to know about Israel? Well, first of all, Paul tells us, Romans 15 and verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. It's written for our what? Our learning. There's some things that we're to be looking at. In, in, like in our study in, in John, there's things that we see that he's doing with the little flock in that nation of Israel that he does the same thing with you and I. It's just a, there's a, the application is different. Notice he says, verse 4, for what sort of things were written aforetime? Well, when would that be? Well, there's Genesis to Acts, isn't it? Notice it's written for our learning. It does not say for our obedience. See that? It's dealing with Israel, not the body of Christ. So it's there for our learning. And it's there for our learning so that we can have what? Patience and comfort and hope. Because what does God do with Israel? Think about Israel's history. They start out rough. They get across the Red Sea. The first thing they do is make a graven image, a calf, and they start dancing to it and making a hubble. And Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and breaks them all up. They don't start out very good, but what does God say? That's okay. That's a mixed multitude. I got a believing remnant. Moses, rewrite the stuff. We're going to go do this. We're going to do that. We're going to... And he looks at them and he says, you're Ichabod. You're not my people, but one day you will be my people. As messed up as Israel gets, yet God still does what with them? Redeems them and brings them back. What does he do with you and I? Same thing. As messed up as we can get and as twisted, I mean, we're his, we're in Christ. What does he do? That's okay, they'll come back around. And if they don't, we got a, an event out in our future called the judgment seat of Christ that's going to fix all that mess. But, so you have this understanding that happens. Look down at verse number 8 of Romans 15. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. Notice, the, obviously he's talking about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And in order to understand the Gospels, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that Christ was what? The minister of the circumcision. But notice, usually that's where we stop in that verse, but you need to keep reading. Why was he the minister of the circumcision? For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So what does Paul expect you to know about some things? About that earthly ministry, but that also to confirm to the promise, promises made unto the fathers. You've got to understand those covenants. You need to have a grasp of some of this of what's going on. You need to pay attention to it. In, in Romans, actually, flip back to chapter 1, chapter 1 of Romans. It's very fascinating. Paul, over the summer, and we'll do it again next summer, I, we were spending some time uh, relaxing, I would say, but not many people thought so, <laughs> looking at events that happened where Paul talks about the Old Testament. We went back and we looked at Adam and Eve, and, and we, I think we got to Abraham. We didn't quite get into Abraham. But look at Romans 1. Look at verse number 3. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Wait a minute. He was made of the seed of David? What is all that about? You see this? You better, have an, you better know that Psalms 132 talks about the promise that God makes to David and David's flesh will sit on the throne and so forth. You need to have an understanding here. Hold on here. Run over to oh, 2 Timothy, I think it is. Yeah, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 8. Hold on to Romans 15, though. Don't let that, babe, that one go. 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Well, wait a minute. What's all that about? If you don't understand the Davidic covenant, which is where the king is going to be crowned and the fact that it's going to, 
he promised in the Abrahamic covenant that they were going to have a throne. A king was going to be given to them. But there's so many, there's 12 tribes in the nation. So which tribe? So he identifies the tribe of Judah. He gets to Judah, but Judah is the biggest tribe of all of them. Who, whose family? Well, then he goes down there to Jesse. And Jesse said, and he looks at around, he says, Duh, your boy's not here. <laughs> he goes, no, I got a young one out there in the field, David. And he says, that's my guy. He's going to be my king. So then David sits on the throne. Solomon sits on the throne. But it isn't Solomon's bad, b- bad blood that's going to sit. It's through David and his reign. So, you, uh, But then what does Paul say? He was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Excuse me. So there's some things here based on what we now learn from Paul, which paints that completed picture. Who do we find? What do we find out? Come back to Romans 15. What do we find out about the Lord Jesus Christ? Not only is he Israel's Messiah, Redeemer, Blesser, Avenger, Deliverer, King, he is also the Savior of the world through Paul's gospel. Here is very specific. Here he goes out to everybody without them. But if you don't understand what he means by the seed of David and that history lesson, what about the seed? Where does the seed start? Starts with the seed of the woman and Eve, doesn't it? Runs into the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob down into Judah. Judah down into Jesse. Jesse into David. David into... Mary through Nathan, see, then into the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very interesting thing. You got to follow, you got to pay attention to. Romans 15, again, real quick, verse 8. Paul, by the way, verse 8 gives you an outline of what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul expects us to know some of these, know these things. to to have a working understanding of what Jesus Christ was doing in his earthly ministry. That's why we take Wednesday night, took Wednesday night, and we've studied the Old Testament, or actually we did an Old Testament survey, then we started Luke, spent three years in Luke, and now we're spending eight years in John. (laughs) And then we'll get to Matthew next, and we'll spend another ten years in Matthew, and then we'll spend eternity in Mark, (laughs) you know. And why? Because you need to have a working understanding, a working knowledge of that. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1. By the way, in Romans, you have, you, you, you see Romans 15, 8? That's an outline given to you of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Flip back to Romans 11. Romans 11, 11 to 15. Romans 11 to, 11 to 15. I say then have they stumbled, and the they there is Israel, that they should fall. God forbid. Well, who did they stumble over? Jesus Christ, the rock of offense. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. When did they fall? Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen. So Romans 11, 11 to 15 gives you an understanding of what's happening in the book of Acts. That there was a stumble, but they didn't fall, but then there was a fall. And because of the fall, verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. So guess what's going to happen? In Acts, we see the fall in Acts 7, and then from 8 to 28, we see them diminish away. And we see who come on, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. What do we see happening there? We see Israel diminishing away, and we see Paul and the body of Christ become the preeminent vehicle, the prominent vehicle. See that? That also, verse 14, if by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Also in the Acts period, verse 15, we see a dispensational change in God's attitude toward the world whole. Now it's reconcilable. Now the message can go out to anyone without Israel as the go-between. 
Ephesians 1. I'm, I'm sorry, so that's Acts. Get Romans 16. Romans 16, verse 25 and 26 give you the outline of the body of Christ and what's going on here. Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. There's Romans and the cross. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There's Ephesians. And the advanced doctrine concerning the church. And by the scriptures of the prophets, having uh, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. There's Thessalonians and how both programs are designed to really work in unison together. Come over to so in Romans, Romans 15, here's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Romans 11, here's Acts. Romans 16, here's Romans to Philemon. It's all laid out for you. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1. So when we talk about why study Israel, well, that's because Paul's telling us some things we ought to know about. We ought to pay attention to. We have to have at least some information about. We don't have to know every detail. And I'll be honest with you, you will never know every detail. Um, when we studied in the past lessons about the covenants, I know that I only scraped six, the top section. <laughs> because when you, you got to get into that thing, and if you do, you'll spend a lifetime scraping down sections. You know, I went back and looked at a couple of the old lessons, and even the platforms changed. The bigger board, it's not white, it's, you know, it's green, it's all, you know, I look a little better today than I did back then, you know, <laughs> and so forth. But look, look at Ephesians 1, look at verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that... In the dispensation, the perp, what he's purposed in his self, what, what is the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure is, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Folks, you need to understand Israel to have a full grasp of the dispensation of the fullness of times. What's going on out there? The program where... Time comes to its fulfillment. You need to have an idea about that. You need to have an understanding that what is Israel's goal? What are they? Their government. And in that dispensation of the fullness of times, and we've studied it out in other studies, which runs out about 33, maybe 35,000 years, if you have to have a year on it, what is he doing? He's purifying and setting up the government of his kingdom the government of the universe, Israel in her rightful place, everything running, the body of Christ in, the, in our rightful place, everything running, and it's all for His honor and for His glory. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we uh, hit the summer here and we begin the summer series again, uh, we'll spend some time here in 1 Corinthians 10 but I'll uh, just kind of hit it here this evening just so that you see what's going on. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 12, uh, really through 15, but uh, specifically here, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that, all, how that all our fathers were under the sea and all passed through the cloud uh, uh, and, and all passed, that all our fathers were under the cloud and that all passed through the sea. Where was that at? What are we talking about? Red, the crossing, the exodus. Where's the cloud? On the other side, where he leads them in the day by, with the cloud and the fire. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Again, identified with Moses. Moses, <laughs> poor Mo, he gets a rough time with it. He looks around and looks at God and says, God, you're the one that begat these people, not me. Why would you stick them with me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they weren't doing right, and, but yet he's the, the leader. And did all drink the same spiritual, I'm sorry, and, all, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all, by the way, what was the spiritual meat? Manna, the manna from heaven. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that 
followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Then he's going to give a list in verse 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 of all the things that they did in the wilderness. Verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for in samples. Notice he changes the word from example to in sample because the change in the, in the word there, and by the way, I, I know people think they're the same word, just old English, you know, just a, but the, if it was a spelling issue, they would have corrected it because an in sample is not an example where we're out here outwardly doing it, which is what they were doing. An in sample is the stuff inside is what's been coming out of them. You follow that? That's important to see. Because the in sample, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You see, what was happening in Israel, and the reason that... They're our example and our in sample is because they thought that God, when God got them, God got a good deal. They had an internal heart problem, didn't they? So Paul says here, and by the way, verse 6, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 7, he goes back to Exodus 32. Verse 8, he's in Numbers 25. In, num in verse 9, he's in Numbers 21. In verse 10, he's in Numbers 14 <laughs> with all that going on. All right? And in verse 6, he's in Numbers 11 and Deuteronomy 8. And when you go back there and you study those passages out that Paul's making references to, you quickly understand that the internal spiritual condition of Israel was rotten. And they were out here doing the rotten things. So the example and the end sample are correct. You don't need to change them because what was going on inside of them was coming out. And Paul says, you see that, that outward experience stuff over there? You don't do that because their internal nonsense was going on. By the way, if you look down there at verse 13, therefore hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. How does he make a way for you to bear it, to escape it? He doesn't take it out of the way. What's he do? He gives you an internal fortification to do what? To bear it, to go through it, to work down through that. And Israel is our example here on some outward things that we should not be doing, but they're also an in sample to us in that we need to have our insides doing what's right, our inner man. Come over to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, in the first three verses here, four verses. This one, to me, is what got me thinking about this passage of understanding Israel. This one in Romans 15, we'll go back there in just a second. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Notice what Paul says to the, book, to the body of Christ members at Thessalonica. Yourselves know perfectly. You have perfect understanding about the day of the Lord and the fact that it's going to come in the middle of the night. Okay? And when they hear, when, when, when Israel hears people yelling about peace and safety, Jeremiah says, Trouble, Jacob's trouble's coming. See? Verse 4 But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. 
Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. See how what he's telling them is, look, guys, you don't need to be worrying about something that isn't going to get you because you understand we're not them. We are over here. We're not in Israel's program, but rather we are members of the body of Christ. So you know what you need to walk around? You need to walk around as children of the light. So come back, if you will, to, to, to Romans 9. So when Paul talks about some of this stuff, it's important to understand. And Paul Again, Paul assumes that we have some general information, wisdom, and knowledge about the earthly, about Israel's program. Go back to Romans 9. We read the verse 4 or 5, but I want you to, I want to keep reading with you. Uh, verse 4 Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, and the covenants? and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promise. Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For all this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It is said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Do you follow what he's saying there? That If you don't, then you're missing something. You're missing out. And you're missing out on, some, on, 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 on important doctrine from our apostle. L look there at verse number 6. Not as the word of God hath taken on effect, for they, that are, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they that are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in who? In, did Abraham have another boy? He had Ishmael, didn't he? Was it, Ishmael is of the flesh and the seed of Abraham. But he's not the chosen seed, is he? Isaac is. See, if you don't understand that there is another player, Ishmael, you don't scratch your head and go, what in the world is he talking about? They that are of Israel are not of all of Israel. They that are the seed of Abraham are not all children. Then scratch your head. Isaac, how many boys did Isaac have? Two. Who did he have? Jacob and Esau. They have a rightful claim to the birth rights. We, they can say we are of our father Abraham. We are our father Isaac. But who's the chosen seed? Jacob was. See? See, so you got to go back then into the Old Testament and do what with that story? Fetter it out, learn about it, think about it, because that's their past. You, want, you have to come over to Romans 15 again, where we were just a minute ago. We kind of skipped around here. I, I just want to go back up and catch a couple things. See, folks, there, there's some benefit here. Paul assumes that you understand that Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael, and Isaac was the chosen line, and that Isaac had Jacob and Esau, Esau and Jacob, and Jacob is the line. He, he assumes that you understand that. He also understands that you might not, so what do you got to go do? 
study it and learn it up. Look at chapter 15 here. We read verse 4, right? For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now watch verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to to, G- to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're to learn some things here. Verse number four says that we're to, we're written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So we're going to learn about some patience and some comfort and some hope by looking at Israel's program. It's our learning. It's not our obedience. We're not Israel, but we're going to look at it. Verse 5, he says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded. Verse 6, That ye may with one mind and one mouth. You see that oneness issue? It comes from the comfort of the Scripture learning about patience and comfort and hope by looking at Israel and her program. Do you see that? We're to have this one mind and we're to have this comfort over here. And and, and Paul says, the Lord says, look, you go back there and look at what I did with Israel. He looks over there and he, he looks at Moses, looks at the prophets, says, write them a bill of divorcement. They're not, they're out of whoring out there. They're out there married to another guy to the gods, Baal. Write them a bill of divorcement. They're not my people. But then what's he going to do with them? He's going to go up there and remarry them, isn't he, when it's time. Boy, that's some comfort right there. (laughs) I said it a few minutes ago about, man, think about how messed up we get sometimes. And yet, what does he do? You're mine. Come on in here. Look back. uh, well, the context of Romans 15 comes out of Romans 14. And, it, and really this passage here in Romans 15 is at the end of the weaker brethren section. If you look at 14.1, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Drop down to verse 19 of chapter 14. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things where, wherewith one may edify another. Boy, that's our attitude to take with each other, especially in a weaker brother, stronger brother attitude. Verse 1 of fifth, chapter 15, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. What are we to do? We're to bear up some infirmities. Verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Well, how are we going to do that? Verse 1 and 2, let it, what are we going to do? We're going to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his, for his good edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. That's Psalm 69. So the first example of bearing the infirmities is who? Christ, in verse 3. The next illustration is going to be in verse 4, and that's going to be, we're going to see it in Israel as well, where they buck up and they bear the burdens of one another. So when we come down through the the study of Israel and understanding Israel, The main reason to understand Israel is because Paul assumes that you know some things about her and about her program, okay? So what we're going to do now that we're back in, we'll just take a few minutes and then we'll call it an evening, okay, is, and we will normally never be this short, we will be the hour, okay? (laughs) But what we're going to do, starting in the next lesson, is we're going to understand, I'm going to spend some time with you, looking at the justification and the sanctification package of the nation of Israel. 
when we use terminology like justification, what is, what is it to be justified? Simply it is to be declared righteous, okay? When we use the term salvation, salvation just means to save one from some untoward situation. Those words are usually attributed to mean you're going to be saved from the death and the penalty of sin. But in Scripture, we're going to see that it's not always the case, especially with Israel. And there's a group of information with Israel. What is the only response that God ever, ever, ever accepts from man, no matter where you're at in Scripture? Faith. How do you know that? Look at Noah. What did, by faith, what did Noah do? Went and built a boat, the ark. He believed God when God said, it's going to rain, and that rain is going to be a judgment. I need you to build a boat for the righteous. Hebrews says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We find out, by the way, later that not only was Noah there, but Enoch was there as well from the reference in Jude, and he's out there preaching the same thing. Judgment is coming. But what did Noah do? Noah heard the word. What was the word to Noah? Build a boat. Build the ark. Here's the dimensions. Here's how you're going to do it. Do you know that Noah did not call the animals to the ark? God did. Noah's job was to build the boat and to get him and his family on it. God called the ark, and anyone else that wanted, because Noah was warning them. I mean, it was not just limited to Noah and his family, because he's out warning them, hey, judgment's coming. But what did, God, what did Noah give God that God said, you're, you're a preacher of righteousness? Simple faith in the Word of God. So when we talk about justification and salvation, it doesn't always mean how we think about it in Israel's program. So we're going to look at that. We'll spend six, seven, eight weeks just looking at it. There's a long list of them. Then we're going to spend a couple of weeks looking at the year of Jubilee in Israel. Again, all pointed to, okay, to, to Israel. But there's also a year, not just 50, but seven, where the indentured servants are let go it's after seven years. So there's a jubilee. We're going to look at the cities of refuge. When Matthew, look over there at Matthew. And I got these written down so I remember to go over them. (laughs) I I, I said, look at Matthew um, 24. I I said one time, well, we're going to look at this and that. And I didn't write it down. And then I got an email about a year later. Hey, you never looked at this. (laughs) So I got them written down. We're going to look at the city of refuge. In Israel's history, in, 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 the, in the law, there are cities of refuge that someone could go to and not be touched by the uh, accuser. Okay? Look at Matthew 24, verse number 20, uh, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. This will be Daniel 9. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in, where? Judea, very specific, do what? Flee to the mountains. Okay? There are cities in the mountains that are cities of refuge, they're called, that they can flee to and the accuser can't get at them. Come to Revelation 12. Watch this work out here. But these cities are identified in the Old Testament. That's where I'm headed for, okay? Revelation 12, you have the war in heaven, starting in verse 7, where Satan and Michael, and they duke it out, and the Lord comes in, and they clean out Satan and, and the adversary and his angels. They lose the heavenly positions. You and I are then installed into those heavenly positions. Verse number 13, Revelation 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman, that's Israel, which brought brought forth the man-child. That's the 144,000, the little flock. That is not the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. 
that she might fly into the where? The wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Do you, you, you see that thing about the wilderness into her place, and she's there for three and a half years from the face of the serpent? The serpent is called the accuser of the brethren. They are literally in the midst of that week event, which is where Revelation 12 sits, going to end up fleeing into these cities of refuge where the accuser can't get to them. And there's going to be a table set. The table of the Lord will be set up, and he'll provide for them while the time, the back three and a half years, move on out of Daniel 9. So we're going to look at the city of refuge. And it's, they're identified uh, in Scripture to where they're at. And um, they're, uh, uh, mostly they're just made reference to, uh, especially like in the, in the book of Daniel, he'll make reference to them and so forth. So we'll look at them. We'll look at the law about that, the accuser. We'll spend some time doing that. Then we're going to just look at um, miscellaneous things that kind of come along as we go. But before we do the miscellaneous stuff, we're going to do a survey of the Old Testament. We're going to go down and look at each book, and we're just going to lay it out. And, and again, I'm just digging at the top layer, because to dig down, we will never get out of the justification issue. And I would like not to spend 10 years just talking about that. I'd like to just give you some headliners and, and then a guy one time said, you can spend a lifetime studying Israel but you should rather spend a lifetime studying Paul and Romans to Philemon. So let's just spend a little time so we understand some things. When he says, hey, did you know Abraham, not everybody of Abraham's flesh is the seed line. You can say, yeah, I do, that's Ishmael, and here's Isaac, and here's Jacob, and here's Esau, and you, you understand that, and you get that into your thinking, okay? So I got a little road map. And, and again, there are things we'll, we'll make mention to the Sabbath and stuff, so we may just kind of re-hit on some of that. But we're going to start with this issue of Israel's justification and their salvation package. Um, there are literally let me look here real quick. There are literally I should have had this out already. Something like 15 different justifications and salvations in Scripture. There's 15 or 16 of them. It's just a phenomenal amount. And when, when you hear people talk about things, you kind of go, oh, yeah, justification. That's salvation from the death, debt, and penal, debt, debt and death of the penalty of sin. And he's not talking about that at all. <laughs> you know, he's actually talking about paying off a debt over here <laughs> and doing some other things. So, We'll spend some time doing that, okay? So hopefully, why are we looking at Israel? Paul assumes you know something about our program and you need to. And I'll be honest with you, if you're with us, especially in so far in the study of John, it's been a great help to then be able to understand some of the things that we have in Christ. Because it's just, it's, when he says that we're blessed with all spiritual, look, look at Ephesians. I told you we wouldn't be done before the hour. Look at Ephesians 1. Uh, it, it, look here in Ephesians 1. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We're blessed be the God, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, the Father is the one doing this, by the way, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, before him in love, having predestinated us unto the, isn't that an interesting thing? Adoption of children by Jesus Christ. You see that issue of adoption? The adoption that we have is the same adoption that Israel has in her program. The difference is, is we've got it now, they're waiting for it in the kingdom. It's the same thing. And by the way, and it's given to both of us by the Father. You, so when you think about this stuff, uh, come over to um, Titus, Titus, uh, Titus chapter two. 
So when you think about this stuff, if you don't have an understanding of Israel, when you come to that adoption, you are literally swimming upstream without a paddle. It's very hard to get. That's why most people struggle when you talk about our adoption and, and, and our sonship. They struggle with it because they don't have a grasp of the big picture of what he's doing. Look at Titus 2, uh, verse 14, talking about uh, the grace of God. Verse 11, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, now watch, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That is information out of Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. When he looks at Israel and says, If you obey my commandments, then you're going to be a royal priest, a peculiar people. You're going to be my people. Paul uses it in reference to you and I, because what are we? We're his people. But if you don't catch what he's doing back there, this kind of loses a little bit of its, wow. It's just, oh, okay, cool. You know, we're zealous of good. He'll go back there in, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? Boy, the mind's just not working. Uh, it's uh, chapter 6, I believe it is. But I think it's 2 Corinthians. That's my... Yeah, 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, you start there in verse 11. We're not going to read the whole thing. He's talking about the believers being... Verse 16. Look at 6.16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And basically, by the way, verse 14, 15, and 16 has nothing to do about being in business with an unsaved person has nothing to do about being married to an unsaved person. 1 Corinthians 7 takes care of the marriage issue, okay? What he's talking about is you participating in the religious system out there. What agreement does, hath the temple of God? Who's the temple of God? Well, he just, going, he just told you earlier, what, know you not that you are the temple of God? You're bought with a price. You're not your own. You belong to him. What dare, how dare you be over there messed up in that religious system with idols? Now watch what he says. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Does that sound something like he said to Israel? Yes. Wherefore, here's Isaiah 52, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. He just brings that, that principle of separation that Israel has, has been beat into their heads, and he just brings it right into you and I and says, same principle applies to you over here. And he quotes Isaiah, he quotes Daniel, he quotes Jeremiah, he's quoting there. And he says, but man, if you don't understand what they're doing back over here, then that issue of separation, Daniel 1, Daniel establishes the, biblical, the doctrine of biblical separation in Daniel 1, specifically in verse 8. You don't catch what he's doing back there, you'll miss the importance of it for you and I. So, without spending another 10 minutes, <laughs> okay? So, what's going on here in this study, it's, I, to me, it's very critical. You don't have to grasp every detail. I'll be honest with you, I don't know many men who do, but because there is so much. But you just got to have an idea. It's like, oh, okay, I got that. I can... I got that. I, you know, we call it the Sunday school stories for the kids. Well, this, we're the grown-up kids, and we got to catch this stuff because it's in order to appreciate us and what he's doing and what he has done for us. You come over here and look at what he's doing, what he's done and will do for them, and you go, wow. What he did for them, he's done for you and I. 
Those spiritual blessings are past tense. We've got them. Blessed. That's done. All we're missing is that new body. Guess what? They get a new body too. It's just an earthly body. You know, when he resurrects Abraham and those guys up into the kingdom, going into the kingdom there in those 75 days of party, inaugurational party time, they got to have a new body because you can't find them. Their bones have been long dust. So they get, a new, they get a resurrection body as well. And that resurrection body for them then lives on out, has the capacity to live on out to eternity. Okay? All right, so we have the track is laid, the plan's there, and as anything, the, you know, when they talk about war, the first time you shoot, then the plan goes out the door. So we'll try not to do that too much, but we'll, we will uh, have a good time looking into all of this, okay? All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the study. We thank you for the folks here, and we thank you for everything that we have in your Son. In your name we pray. Amen.